Hello everyone, um, I'm Spencer once again, and today we're going to get started on lecture six, which is all about hypothesis testing. And basically hypothesis testing is a framework that we have in statistics where we can take notions that we've already got about the world, some hypothesis that we've got about some group of people or some phenomenon that we have in the world, and collecting data about it, and then maybe changing our original hypothesis if the data doesn't quite line up. And um, today I'm recording from sunny Chicago, Illinois. I'm um, here for a week just visiting. Um, that's why I've got a different background today. Um, I was just kidding. It's not actually very sunny today. It's quite cold and rainy, but I'm doing my best. Um, it's a little different from Berkeley, but we'll make it through. Um, so yeah, so conceptually, we're going to make original claims about data. Um, hypothesis testing, we're going to evaluate those claims. And then um, we'll go through some mathematical statistical methods that will help us draw conclusions. And um, hopefully we'll learn more about a phenomenon that we'd like to learn about in the process. So some foundations, some basic terms that, um, that underlie everything about hypothesis testing. The term population just means the entire group of people or objects or whatever that you'd like to learn about. So if you'd like to learn about what percentage of people in the world are vegetarian, then in this case, your population would just be all the people in the world. Um, and what a sample is, is you can only really survey so many people in that, in that whole population. You can't go around the world and ask every single person if they're vegetarian. You feasibly, you feasibly can't do that. Um, but what you can do is ask, let's say a thousand people and you want to make it as representative as possible of everyone and ask those people if they're vegetarian and then try and take that data and represent the larger population. Um, so here's just another diagram of it. You can see that the population is a much larger group of people and sample, we just take a few of those people and we try to make it as representative of the population at large. You can see you've got people who have different walks of life in this sample. And um, a hypothesis is an assumption about the population that may or may not be true. It's based on either some notion that we had in the past or some data we may have collected before. But in statistics, we're all about refining our hypotheses. So, and that's what we'll be doing today with hypothesis testing. And here's just another diagram to hammer it in. Population and sample is a portion of that population. And then we draw conclusions based on the sample to find more about the population. One more quick thing before I go on is a few other terms. In the analogy that I just gave, if we want to find out about how many people in the world are vegetarian, what percentage, we want to find out a parameter about our global population. How many, how many vegetarian people exist in the world is a parameter, but we can't find that parameter. The best we can do is take a, stamp, a sample and estimate based on that sample. And when we ask our sample how many people out of this group are vegetarians, we're collecting a statistic. So a statistic is to a sample what, oh I man, it's getting covered up by uh, Google Slides, but a statistic to a sample is what a parameter is to a population. And those are important terms. So once again, we have some notion about the world and we'd like to see if it holds up given data. And Basically, what our hypothesis test will give us as a result is it gives us a percent probability. And to sum it up, what, it, what the percent probability is, it's the chance that we would receive the data that we have just collected, given that our null hypothesis is true. So back to our vegetarian percentage uh, uh, estimate. If let's say we estimate that 30% of the global population is vegetarian and you do a survey of a thousand people and you find that 700 of them are vegetarian. So 70% of our population is vegetarian. Well, that appears to contradict the 30% uh, hypothesis we had before. And running our hypothesis test, we would get a probability percentage that tells us how likely it was that the 70% that we received was due to chance. And here's, so here's another diagram of the hypothesis testing process. We go from population to sample, we take a, st a test statistic, and 
the we receive our percent probability, which in statistics is called a p-value. And based on that p-value, we can decide whether to reject or keep our hypothesis that we had. Here's another example um, in everyday life. Let's say we've got a family and there's four children in this family and they're all trying to argue amongst themselves and figure out who's going to do the dishes every night. And they want a fair way of deciding who does the dishes. So um, the oldest sibling, Bill, out of Bill, Jack, Emily, and Amanda, decides that they can take chips out of hat. They can put four chips in a hat. Each one has one of their names and draw every night and figure out. They all decide this is fair, and for the first four nights, there doesn't seem to be an issue. But as things start going on, Bill's name doesn't come up for some reason. Maybe maybe they're just not reaching deep enough into the bag or something, or his, or maybe he didn't write his name down, or he, write, he wrote someone else's name down on his ship or something, but no one knows because no one's looking in the bag. Um, so this goes on for a few days, and people just say it's because of luck. But after 12 days, people are starting to get suspicious of Bill. He, maybe he gamed the system. So you can run a hypothesis test on this. And as we'll see, running a hypothesis test on a situation like this is going to take a lot of simulating this model. And we have mathematical models that we can use in Python to simulate testing this to the order of 1,000, 10,000 times. So we'll see that Python is a very, very important tool. Python, data science, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, all very important tools in running simulations for testing like this. Hey guys, I am Saeed and I'm one of your TAs for this class. I am a second year studying applied math and data science. So moving on to the lecture, hopefully by now, you've got a basic understanding of what a hypothesis test really is. So we are gonna try and define the steps that make up any hypothesis test. So the first step, of course, is to define the null and the alternative hypotheses. Then we're gonna try and choose an appropriate test statistic for our experiment. Then we're gonna calculate the p-value and interpret the results we get from it using the significance level that we choose for our test. All hypothesis tests consist more or less of these foundational concepts, but sometimes done more methodically. This really helps us to ensure standardization and uniformity. So in any statistical investigation, we're essentially trying to prove whether there is or there isn't any statistical significance between two variables. The null and the alternative hypotheses are a set of two mutually exclusive hypotheses that cover every possible result. The null hypothesis is the one that says there is no statistical significance between the variables involved the alternative hypothesis is the one that says that there is statistical significance between the variables concerned. Collectively, they're exhaustive as there is either some statistically significant relationship between the variables or there isn't. There's no in between. So after our investigation, we either reject the null hypothesis or we'll fail to reject the null. In failing to reject the null, we are essentially saying that we do not have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis might still be false in reality, but based on the evidence we have, we cannot conclusively reject it. So there's always a room for error in any statistical analysis, and we're all always going to try and account for that. So the null hypothesis always attributes any anomalous data to random chance rather than any correlation. And the alternative hypothesis being the exact opposite always attributes any anomalous data to something other than chance. It basically supports the idea that there's some other external factor, which is not random chance that may be influencing the results. So moving on to some examples of null and alternative hypotheses, we're gonna go back to the example you saw earlier on, which was the name drawing example. The null hypothesis in such a situation would probably be that the chip drawing system is fair at any Variation from our expected result is solely due to random chance. The alternative hypothesis, on the other hand, would be that the chip drawing system is biased towards Bell. So another simple example of this could be a study related to the fairness of a coin. The null hypothesis in this case would be that the coin is fair and any variation from the expected results are due to only random chance. The alternative hypothesis, on the other hand, is that the coin is unfair and there is something other than chance causing the results. 
Now, there are a lot more uh, you know, complex examples of hypothesis tests as well, and a lot more scientific studies. You know, something like that could probably be a study related to you know, the growth of a plant when you have introduced perhaps some new mineral into the soil that it's growing in. But there are a lot of other applications as well, which you'll hopefully see with your assignments and further down the line. So to summarize what we've done so far, the null hypothesis is a statement about a population parameter. And the alternative hypothesis is another statement, but one that directly contradicts the null hypothesis. We test the likelihood of the statement being true in order to decide whether to accept or to reject our alternative hypothesis. And similarly, we determine whether or not to accept or reject the statement based on the likelihood of the null hypothesis being true. So some conventions that you might note are that in our null hypothesis, we can include science that is equal to, less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to science. And on the alternative hypothesis side, we can, not, we can include you know, the exact opposites. So moving on to the test statistic, this is you know, a really important part of your experiment because we're trying to find a single value that will help us make a decision about the results of our experiment. So as we can see here, a test statistic is a single value that contains information about the data of a particular sample that is relevant to deciding whether to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. So we're gonna see an example from the siblings example we saw before. A good test statistic is the number of times Bill had to do the dishes. So the test statistic is the value that we use to make inferences about the credibility of the null hypothesis. Based on these values, we can either reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis as we saw already. So now we're gonna try and see some simple examples of what test statistics might look like. So a hypothesis test on the name drawing example, we already know the null hypothesis that the chip drawing system is fair. The alternative hypothesis being that it's biased towards Bell. Now you might be thinking what the test statistic might be. Um, the difference between the times Bell is drawn from the average number of times everyone is drawn is the test statistic that we can use to basically reach a conclusion about the results of this particular hypothesis test. Low values of this test statistic would point towards the null, whereas high values would point towards the alternative. So we know that the null is that the chip drawing system is fair. If we get a low value of the test statistic we have chosen, this would basically point towards the null being true. Now, another example, is the study related to the fairness of a coin. We know that the null is that the coin is fair. The alternative being that the coin is unfair. Now the test statistic that we might choose in this case is the absolute difference between half and the proportion of heads observed. Now half is essentially the probability of getting heads. And we're gonna compare that to the proportion of heads we actually get. Now this test statistic is actually pretty basic and in some contexts, we would consider it to be very flawed. So we could use another test statistic called TVD, the total variation distance, and it's not discussed here, but it might be better suited for such experiments. Now, I really encourage you guys to read more on it since it could be useful in applications of hypothesis testing further down the line. Now, defining p-value, which we saw earlier on. The p-value is the quantification of the chance that under the null hypothesis, the test statistic is equal to the value that was observed in the data or is even further in the direction that supports the alternative. So this is kind of like a probability that we're trying to calculate. So if we assume that the null hypothesis is true, the probability of receiving the results we have received is in fact the p-value. You are testing your hypothesis for a particular set of data you already have. The p-value is the probability of a certain or more extreme observation of the test statistic happening, given that the null hypothesis is true. So we're not just accounting for the value, the extreme value that we observed, but even values that are further in that direction, we're also going to account for those while calculating the p-value. So a small p-value indicates strong evidence against the null hypothesis. So you reject the null hypothesis. A large p-value indicates weak evidence against the null hypothesis. So you'll fail to reject the null hypothesis in that case. 
Now, we're gonna discuss significance level. So on the previous slide, you might be thinking, how do we know that the p-value is really small? Or how do we know if it's big enough that we won't reject the null? So the significance level is what really helps us decide that. It is the arbitrary p-value threshold at which we go from rejecting the null to fail to rejecting the null. The p-value threshold is the lowest possible p-value accepted that still supports the null hypothesis. And it is something we must choose as statisticians. So in simple English, how big a coincidence would you have to accept to believe the null hypothesis? So again, we can you know, just recap. This is an arbitrary p-value threshold. And it is something that we must choose when we're trying to do a statistical test. So these are some of the conventions we can use while you know, trying to interpret the p-value. The p-value being greater than 0 0.05 is considered to be non-significant. When it gets below 0 0.05, essentially 5%, you know, it'll become increasingly more significant. And when we get down to something like 0 0.001 to 0 0.005, it'll start becoming moderately significant and then strongly significant. So this diagram is particularly useful and helpful when trying to understand the p-value, you know, in terms of probability, extreme values, and all of that. So this is a diagram showing, you know, the observations that we've made. This is the set of possible results. This is the probability of getting those results. So the most likely observation, obviously, since it is the most likely observation, we can see you know, the greatest probability. And then these two sides being, you know, the extremes. Now, let's just say that our observed data point lies here. So maybe in an example related to a coin toss, where we're trying to see the number of heads, this could be, you know, getting 40 heads out of 50 times, you know, so more than the most likely observation. So this is what the p-value would really be. A p-value, the green shaded area, is the probability of an observed or more extreme result arising by chance. So this is exactly that. And of course, going further down to the right-hand side or the left-hand side, we'll get increasingly unlikely observations. So as I mentioned earlier on in this part of the lecture, that our conclusions can actually be wrong. In any statistical analysis, we obviously have to account for error and accept that. So let's just say that the null was in fact true. And due to our data, our sample, we ended up rejecting the null. So that would be an error. And you know, if we reject the null and the alternative was true, that, would, you know, that wouldn't be an error. In fact, that's when we get it right. So if the test doesn't reject the null and the null is true, we're doing it right. But again, if the test doesn't reject the null and the alternative was true, that's another error. So these are the two kinds of errors that you might see in your hypothesis tests. So it's kind of difficult to reach a proper conclusion whenever we, we're doing these kind of things, you know, but just keep that in the back of your mind and you know, just move on with the test itself while knowing that there is a room for error. So simulation is where you really see the power of Python and Jupyter notebooks. We'll be using Python to simulate probability and repeated tasks, creating probability distributions, helping us decide which hypothesis to accept. Computers are good at doing repetitive mechanical work under certain quantifiable predefined conditions. These terms will hopefully get more clear once we move on to the demo. We can use this to our advantage to simulate tasks that are mathematically well-defined, like the flip of a fair coin or the roll of a fair die a very large number of times. We can even simulate the flip of an unfair coin as long as the exact level of unfairness is decided. You can use something like this using a NumPy array. So we're gonna be going over a demo of a hypothesis test in simulation. We're gonna be using an example of a coin being tossed 2000 times. And we're gonna suppose that we're getting heads 950 times. Looking at this disparity, we hypothesize, we hypothesize that the coin is unfair. Our null hypothesis is still, however, that the observed results are due to random chance. This means that the coin is fair. Our alternative hypothesis states that the observed results are caused by something other than chance 
the coin is unfair or biased in a certain way. Now we're gonna be going over to the Jupyter Notebook to run the demo. We'll also be going over a more complex demo later on, which should reinforce the concepts even more. So we're gonna be using the NumPy library for this particular demo, since it is you know, pretty powerful when we're trying to make arrays, doing a process testing, all of that stuff. So most of these things um, you've already seen, but just to recap, the first step that we're gonna do is to define the hypothesis themselves. As we know that all statistical tests attempt to choose between two views of the world. Specifically, the choice is between two views about how the data was generated. And these two views are called hypotheses. So we already know that the null hypothesis is the clearly defined model about chances. And this is what we're gonna use to simulate data. On the other hand, the alternative hypothesis states that some other factor, external factor is responsible for the given data different from the prediction made in the null hypothesis. So as we know, our example is considering the considering an experiment, analyzing whether a given coin is fair or biased. On tossing this coin 2000 times, we get heads 950 times. Now we'll try to understand whether this is down to chance or not. The null hypothesis is that the coin is fair, the variation of the expected results 1000 is due to random chance. Now we know that the expected results is 1000 because the probability of getting heads is half, multiplying one over two by 2000 rows, you're gonna get 1000. The alternative hypothesis is that the coin is unfair and there is something other than chance causing the results. So we're gonna use a Python array to represent a fair coin. The two possible outcomes will be heads and tails. We can use Python to make choices at random and this is where NumPy really comes into play. There is a sub module called random that contains many functions involving random selection. One of these is called choice, which we are gonna use. It's gonna pick one item at random from an array, and it is equally likely to pick any of the items. This is pretty close to simulating an actual coin toss since it's entirely random. Now, define the coin, we can run it. Now we have a coin with two possible options, heads or tails. Now we're gonna represent 2000 coin tosses using the np.random.choice function. This basically creates an array storing all of those results. Now that we've run that, we can see the number of times we're getting heads. Now you might be thinking that this should be 1000, but again, this is entirely random. And if you flip a coin 10 times, it's not necessary that you get, you're gonna get heads exactly five times. Running this, we can see that now we're getting heads 1023 times. Now, if we run these again, we're getting heads 949 times. So every time you run these cells again and again, it basically repeats all of those steps. Now we can just move forward with 949 heads out of 2000 coin tosses. Now, in order to increase the reliability of our simulation, we're gonna repeat these 2000 coin tosses as many times as possible. Um, we're gonna skip this for now and come back to it later on. Now, the second step is, of course, to choose the test statistic. In order to decide between the two hypotheses that we have, we must use a statistic that we can use to make the decision. Now, hopefully, you know, you're getting a grip on these terms. And you know, in order to really decide the appropriate test statistic in our experiment, it's important to really analyze you know, what we're trying to conclude from this experiment. Now, we know that in this case, we're trying to understand whether this coin is fair or not, and we know the number of heads. So the test statistic in this scenario would actually be quite simple. We're just gonna use the absolute value of the number of heads we're getting minus 1000, which is the expected result. Now we're using 1000 because we're accounting for both of the possibilities that we get you know, heads too many times or we get tails too many times because we're not saying that the coin might be biased just towards heads. We're just trying to see whether it is fair or not. So moving forward with this test statistic, we can now try to really find the distribution of the test statistic under the null hypothesis. Now, this is the main computational aspect of testing hypothesis, because we're trying to figure out what the values of the test statistic might be if the null was true. Doing this manually might just take too long, and it's really easy for us simply to do this using Python and Jupyter Notebooks. The test statistic is simulated based on the assumptions of the model in the null hypothesis, 
This model involves chance, so the, so the statistic comes out differently when you simulate it multiple times. As we saw above, you know, this is just pretty similar to that concept. Now we're gonna use Python to create a simulation of tossing a fair coin 2000 times. In order to increase the reliability of our simulation, it is important to repeat 2000 coin tosses as many times as possible. Um, I'm just gonna do this 10,000 times and I'm gonna be using an iteration, which basically involves employing a for loop. Now we, we're gonna initiate, initialize a, an array, an NumPy array called heads. This is gonna store the results of our simulation. So we're gonna be using this particular syntax. Um, this is pretty standard. Hopefully, you know, by really looking at it, you'll understand what's happening. So for i in np.a range 10,000, 10,000 being the number of times you want to repeat it. Um, we're gonna be using another array called outcomes, which is calling np.random.choice on coin, which is, you know, the array representing heads and tails 2,000 times. And the number of heads is, of course, counting non-zero on outcomes equal to heads. Now, now you might be thinking, why are we counting non-zero? Hopefully, you've got a basic understanding of this. If not, you know, we need we know that the count outcome array basically stores, you know, some strings, strings being heads or tails. And when we're using a boolean to compare that, a true value basically means one, and false is represented by zero. So, you know, just counting the number of times we get true values is the number of times we're getting heads. So now, you know, for this one particular, uh, you know, simulation, we're gonna append our original heads array to the number of times we're getting heads for this one simulation. And we're gonna repeat this 10,000 times. Just to make sure that we've run this 10,000 times, we can find out the length of our heads array, which is storing the results of each and every simulation. This length is of course 10,000. Now moving on to the conclusion of our hypothesis test is where we're gonna try and calculate both the p-value then use the significance level to either accept the null hypothesis or reject it. Now, the choice between the null and the alternate hypothesis depends on the comparison between what you computed in steps two and three, the observed value of the test statistic and its distribution as predicted by the null hypothesis. If the two are consistent with, the, with each other, then the observed test statistic is in line with what the null hypothesis predicts. If not, then we say that the test rejects the null hypothesis. Now, we know what our test statistic is. It's the absolute value of the number of times we get heads and the difference of it from the expected value of heads being 1000. Now, we know that we're getting heads 950 times, so the observed test statistic would obviously be 50. Now, we're gonna try and find out the test statistic for our simulation of 2,000 coin tosses done 10,000 times. Now this array will basically store the results of the test statistic. And we can go in and run that. Now we have this particular array representing the simulation. Now we'll try to find the chance of getting heads less than or equal to 950 times or more than or equal to 1,050 times using our results of the test statistic from the simulation which we ran under the assumptions made in the null hypothesis. So hopefully this uh, syntax is, you know, becoming, you know, you're basically understanding what's going on here. And we know that 10,000 is the number of repetitions. And this is basically just like calculating probability. So we run that, we get 0 0.0278. So the probability of getting heads 950 times or less or 1,050 times or more is less than 5%. Actually, it is 2.78% when we flip a fair coin 2,000 times under 10,000 simulations. Now, this chance is called the observed significance level of the text, which is the p-value. Now, the significance level or the p-value threshold that we're gonna use for this experiment is the you know, conventional threshold that is 5%. Now, the p-value of the test, as we know, is the chance that the test statistic will be equal to the observed value in the sample or even further in the direction that supports the alternative. So going back to the diagram that you saw in the lecture, this is basically you know, lying right under the tail of that particular graph. So we know that if the p-value is small, that means the tail beyond the observed statistic is small. So the observed statistic is far away from what the null predicts. This implies that the data supports the alternative hypothesis better than they actually support the null. So going back to the convention, 
since we're using a threshold of 5%, this is quite small, and we're gonna call the result statistically significant. If the p-value would have been even smaller, as we know, less than 1%, the result is called highly statistically significant. So our result isn't actually highly statistically significant, but still is somewhat statistically significant. So by this convention, our p-value is considered small, and therefore the null hypothesis in our experiment is not supported, and the difference between the number of heads cannot be concluded to be solely due to chance. Now, as we know, there is a room for error, and hopefully in the lecture, you now see how we can account for that and try to make the margin for error as small as possible. So now that you finished watching Saeed's model in his stupid notebook of how you can simulate a hypothesis test using a two-sided coin flip, we'll go over a few things that you may or may not have learned from data eight and sort of wrap it all up for this lecture. So the steps, once again, for assessing a model are you come up with a statistic um, based, that'll help you decide whether your data supports the model that you already have or a different model. Then you'll simulate the statistic, and that's what you saw with the um, the 10,000 iterations of a coin flip that you use to create like this, this normal distribution. Um, and you'll see with my Jupyter notebook that we're going to draw a histogram of all those values, and it sort of gives us our um, our prediction of where our data should lie. And then we'll compute the observed statistic from that sample. We'll compare that value with what we've got in the histogram and we'll see if they're consistent. And then we can use that to decide whether we'll go with or reject our, our hypothesis. One really important method that you might have used in data eight in Jupyter notebooks is sample proportions. And sample proportions does a lot of those tests, a lot of those steps of the test from the previous slide, but in one place. So the first argument to sample proportions is the number of times you want to run the test. And the second argument is um, the distribution of probabilities that we're going to go with. So let's say if we want to simulate a coin flip, then our pop distribution would be a list of the respective probabilities of landing on either side. So if it's, an, if it's a fair coin, then it would be 0.5 and 0.5 because those are the probabilities of the two sides. And if we want an unfair coin toss, then we could do 0.7 to 0.3, and that would give us a skewed probability distribution. And it would simulate that probability the number of times that you've put in sample size. So it does a lot of those for loop steps that you would have had to do in several lines of code, but it does it in one line of code here. One final thing that I'll talk about before the end of our lecture and before I go into the Jupyter Notebook is Sometimes the conclusion that we draw from a hypothesis test can be wrong because we don't know the original proportion of the population. We don't know the original parameter. There is a chance that we're drawing an incorrect conclusion. And that's something that we can't 100% rule out. There's two overall types of error that we could receive. And I'll go ahead and switch into my iPad because I've got this presentation set up on there. So, uh, once again, this is on top, this is a flowchart of our data-driven discovery where we create our hypotheses, collect our data, and then select our parameters and find our probability percentage and then decide whether to reject the hypothesis. So, two types of errors. Type one error is where the null hypothesis that, was, that we reject was originally true. So, from the vegetarian example that we said in the past, if it turns out that there actually was 30% of our population vegetarian, but the data we got said that there was 70, then we have just executed a type one error. We just found a type one error. Another example that I've written here is a doctor tells an old man he's pregnant, which obviously it isn't true. Um, the null hypothesis being that this person was not pregnant, but the doctor rejected it and came up with an alternative, which clearly here we know that it's not true for this case. The other type of error that we could get is a type two error. And this is when the null hypothesis was wrong in the first place, but we failed to reject it. Um, and in this case, an example would be a doctor tells a very clearly pregnant woman that she isn't. Um, he just looked at her ultrasound and there's very clearly um, some, a fetus developing, but 
but the doctor says that she's not pregnant. Um, so these errors can be caused by different things, um, but we'll get into that in a second. So this is just this is just all the different types of errors summarized. This is happy face here, happy face here, because we're in line with what's really the real parameter in the world, and these are errors. And once again, we don't know whether we've received an error because we can't know the original population parameter. So this is just something that we would get evidence for. So how do we reduce the chance of type one and type two error? So one parameter that hasn't been defined in doing a hypothesis tests is the alpha value. And we define that alpha value as the probability of getting a type one error. So I guess it's just kind of circular reasoning uh, to have it defined by what we're gonna have it be. But um, the alpha value as a parameter in our hypothesis test is the, um, the cutoff value that we set for our p-value. So let's say we want a p-value of 5% or less, then that would be our alpha value is 5%. And it makes sense that the lower that we would have that cutoff, the less of a chance that we're gonna reject the null hypothesis. If we have it at 1%, then it's gonna be harder for us to reject the null hypothesis. And there's less of a chance that we get any error that would be associated with rejecting a null hypothesis when it was true in the first place. It's a little bit more complicated for a type two error. So, but this case we want to, we want to increase the chance that we reject the null hypothesis. It's a little bit harder to do that though. Um, but there's two ways that we can do it. We can either increase alpha, so it has the opposite effect of reducing alpha for up here, or we can increase the sample size. And that just generally increases our confidence in our results of our survey. So I just want to show you this one other little cool thing that you can do with your computer. You can actually install a uh, Jupyter Notebook host on your computer and do the notebooks offline. So I can do Jupyter and it starts up. So yeah, here we go. Um, it's in this case, it's just going through all of my computer files, and I've got the notebook here. All right. So for this simulation, we're going to do something a little bit more complicated, and we're going to look at um, how to determine if a dice is rolling fairly or not. So we'll go through this Jupyter Notebook a lot of time. So first, just like in the previous Jupyter Notebook, we imported NumPy, which is our really important uh, numerical mathematical module that we use in Python. And we're also implement, we're gonna implement um, the use of matplotlib, which is a really helpful method for um, creating charts and graphs and essential for a data scientist. And we'll take a look at that a little bit further down. So in this case, we've got two dice here. They're just arrays up here, but um, this one represents a somewhat unfair dice. Um, you can see that um, each one of these numbers in the array is an event that could happen when um, the dice is rolled. And there's a little bit higher of a chance that lower numbers get rolled than higher numbers. And this one is a fair dice. There's only one of each number. So each dice has, each number on the dice has a one six chance of rolling. Uh, we wanted, we don't know either of these arrays though. Let's say we're just looking at the dice and uh, we want to determine if that this one is unfair and this one is fair. Or we know that this one, we know that this one is fair, but we want to determine that this one was unfair. So let's say you, let's say you're playing a game of Monopoly with these dice and you're wondering why everyone's getting low rolls but you don't want people to just to take your word for it. You want to prove it statistically that the dice is unfair. So first, to motivate that investigation, uh, you're going to simulate 2,000 dice rolls. Oh, great, I need to do this. Um, so yeah, so you're going to simulate 2,000 dice rolls. Um, and basically what we've done here, um, NP random choice takes a random choice from the array that you put into it, and it does so 2,000 times. And what we've done down here is we're just printing out all the results of this random choice. So you can see here that lower numbers in this, lower numbers on the dice get more rolls than higher numbers. Now, from first glance, it looks like it can be due to luck. 
um, this there's only like there's only about 40 50 more rolls for one than there are for six but it does look like there's something wrong with the dice um so what we're going to do is run this simulation 10,000 times and collect how many times a six is rolled in each of those simulations and we're also going to simulate what it would look like if we roll a fair dice if we do that same thing with a fair dice 10,000 times as well so So for 2,000 rolls of a die, we're expecting each possible roll to appear around one sixth of the time. So 2,000 divided by six. So our observed test statistic in this case is the difference of our actual percentage of results from the expected number of times. So this time we're just looking at how many times six was rolled. So we get this long array and um, we can't see all of it, but if we just pull up random elements from this array, it does look like everything is pretty negative. So it does look like there's, it does look like um, we're getting a little bit less of what we're expecting than what we're expecting in terms of fairness. Now, let's say we want to do the same thing, but for the fair dice. So if we do fair sixes, 2006. Now in this case, you can already see from the output that we've got that numbers are a little bit more positive, negative. There's a little bit more uh, distribution around zero. So if you do like, well, I'm getting a bunch of negative numbers now, but, but you can see things, the distribution is slightly different here. It's not all negative. It's not all around the 30 in negative. Um, so, and here is what happens when we do map plot loop. So I'll just take it line by line. Basically we're setting up the plot here. Um, and we want to put two histograms on it and we want to compare the number of rolls, the number of rolled sixes from what we expect. Um, on this diagram, the blue represents our dice that we're accusing of being unfair and the orange represents what we already know to be a fair die. So we can already see that the distribution is not where we want it to be. Uh, there is some overlap and that's what the, that's how we're going to form the basis of our p-value. So we'll rerun this slide here. Um, so what we're doing here is we're taking the mean of this distribution and then we're determining it's the percentage of receiving that mean given that this distribution is the true distribution. And it turns out that um, only 0.37% of this data of the true distribution of a dice's rolls falls below this distribution. So we get a p-value of 0.37%. And this p-value is considered very low. So we have statistical evidence now to show that our dice is rigged. So yeah, there we go. Um, that is a little bit more complicated, a little bit more um, in depth of the demonstration of how we run a hypothesis test. Uh, we had a certain preconceived notion, the notion here being that the dice was rigged and we had a little bit of heuristic evidence here. We got some rolls on our die and we determined that uh, higher numbers were getting rolled less than lower numbers. Then we went through and simulated on a massive number of dice rolls here, 2,000 times 10,000. I don't wanna do the math on that in my head, but that's a lot of dice rolls. It's not something you're gonna do in person. It's something you can use Python to do. And then um, we determined the distribution of how many sixes we got um, between a normal die and the dice that we're using. And there was a discrepancy and it's reflected in our p-value. So now we have statistical evidence. So, um, and this is something that applies to a lot of different fields. It's not just necessarily um, there's little probability things like rolling a die or um, flipping a coin. Um, it, you, you can definitely see this in a lot of fields. Like I mentioned earlier, trying to determine some statistic about the population at large or um, even if it isn't about people, even if it's about um, if, if there's a dry season for a set of crops in um, a heavy agricultural part of the country and you're trying to determine if um, 
crop yields are lower due to chance or due to global uh, climate change. So there's lots and lots of applications of, um, of statistical methods like this. And I hope you'll be able to use this in whatever field that um, you're going to.